The battle for control of England in 1066 is often seen as William defeats Harold at Hastings and then becomes ruler of England. However, there was a lot more going on in that year and even William's path to the kingship wasn't that straightforward. Trigger events in England in 1066 were the death of the widely respected King Edward the Confessor. The main problem was that there were a number of potential claimants to the throne and Edward didn't actually have any children. William of Normandy, great-grandfather, was also Edward's grandfather. There were some reports that the throne had actually been promised to William. And there were the two sons of Godwin, Earl of Wessex, Harold Godwinson and Tostig Godwinson. Their sister, Edith, was the wife of Edward the Confessor. Tostig ruled the area of Northumberland for about 15 years, who had maintained the control of the area not by force of arms and repression, but by any attempt at general popularity. The upshot was that the local thanes, or minor nobles, eventually rebelled against his leadership. Edward then sent Harold to talk to the rebels, who represented a significant threat to the stability of the throne of England. So even at this early time, William had openly declared that he wanted the throne of England. The last thing that England needed was a civil war. Harold quickly realised that his brother Tostig was the main problem and advised Edward this was the case. Edward then decided to banish Tostig and the Northumbrian rebels were appeased. The banishment also now left Harold Godwinson in the prime position to become king when Edward died. At the time of Edward's death, Harold was Earl of Wessex and also the Earl of Hereford and totally represented about a third of England. And Harold also being successful a military campaign in Wales against Griffith at Llewellyn. When the Witan, or gathering of nobles, met to decide on who should succeed to the throne of England after the death of Edward, they rapidly decided upon Harold Godwinson as being the best choice. So England was facing some rather serious threats and needed a strong, reliable leader at that time. Two main threats to England would of course come from the other potential claims to the throne, Tostig and William. Uh, both of these would need a serious amount of help if they were to threaten Harold's position as King of England. Tostig first went to Scotland to find support there. Unable to secure much assistance in Scotland, then went to Norway, where Harald III of Norway, nicknamed Harald the Hard Ruler, or Harald Hard Rader, was receptive to his request for support. Harald even had a tenuous claim to the English throne by Magnus the Good to King Canute. Harold Hardrada again was a career warrior and even fought in Constantinople early in his life. However, now rather brutally unified Norway under his rule, he had a rather unsuccessful campaign against Denmark a couple of years earlier. He had a substantial veteran army at his command which could transport almost anywhere by boat. By allying himself with the former Earl of Northumbria, he could potentially use that army to seize Northumbria especially the much-prized city of York. Now, William had a rather hard-fought rule to the power in Normandy, partly due to his illegitimate birth. The Duke of Normandy had to fight several battles and a siege before he had full control of Normandy. Again, this meant that William was an experienced commander at the head of a veteran army. However, William had a couple of major problems he needed to overcome before he could invade England. Firstly, unlike the Vikings in Norway, William lacked enough boats to transport his ship troops across the English Channel. Secondly, whilst William did have a high quality army, it was actually far too small to defeat Harold in the field, let alone trying to subdue the countryside. So, he'd need additional help. William set about recruiting allies and mercenaries and building boats for an invasion. And these threats left Harold Godwinson in a bit of a dilemma as to how to organise a defence. Certainly he lacked the ability to strike at either potential foe before they attacked him, so instead he'd have to wait until they crossed the water to deal with them. So he'd have to think about how he deployed his forces. Part of the issue here was not all the forces were under his direct control and other troops were not that flexible. Let's briefly look at those forces. Firstly, most importantly, were the house cars. These were the backbone of the army, well-trained, well-armoured in chainmail, with high-quality swords and axes and large shields. These men could be relied upon in a fight. 
Generally they fight on foot, occasionally they do use horses or ponies to travel quickly to the battlefield. Whilst there are a substantial number of these men, there are never quite enough of them to meet all the requirements of the army. The rest of the army is made up of what's known as the third, or the form of a local militia. These term collected to the select third and the great third. The select third generally had reasonable equipment, normally a large shield and a spear or an axe, with some may alternatively be equipped with javelins or bows. These troops generally had some previous combat experience, was not elite like the house guards, and they lacked the superior heavy armour, they could generally be relied upon in a battle. The Great Third, on the other hand, was basically all the rest of the able-bodied men of the local area, equipped with a variety of weapons, some of which were improvised, whilst they did undergo some basic training, they were unreliable at best. Now, Harold could have split his forces between the north and the south, that meant that they were unlikely to be strong enough to deal decisive battle in either area. It's also unsure if Tostig would be able to raise a significant force in Norway, and thought that local forces in Northumberland, which were well used to Viking raids, would be strong enough to delay an invasion long enough for him to send support up north. On the other hand, he was certain that William was building up a substantial army in Normandy, and it would invade soon. So it's not even raised more than he assembled an army in the south, waited to find out where William would actually land in England. William, however, had run into a few problems with his new ships, were taking longer to build than he first anticipated, and due to their somewhat hasty construction, he really needed ideal conditions in the English Channel, his army was safely to make it to the other side. In addition, he needed to find a safe place of land away from Harold's army. The Normans were caught by the English army whilst they were still getting out of the boats, be rapidly defeated before they could get organised. In addition to this, he's having to make substantial promises in money, and especially in land, in order to bulk up his army with mercenaries from other parts of France and other northern European countries. These recruits were also taking some time to assemble. Once William was ready to cross the channel, poor weather delayed the crossing once more. It's extremely awkward William, as winter was now approaching, it's unlikely that weather would be ideal for crossing the channel for some time. If he had to wait till next year before the crossing, he's unlikely to keep his army together, let alone feed it all. Now the issue with food was also a major concern for Harold Gobinson on the other side of the channel. As harvest season approached, members of his army that were drawn from the third were needed back on their farms to bring in the harvest. So Harold decided to release the third, knowing that if they were needed, they could be fairly rapidly assembled. Of course, he still had the solid core of his army in the form of the house guards to meet any immediate threat. And whilst this was understandable, it may have been a serious miscalculation. So look at what happened next in the next video.